All right, good afternoon, everybody. TLS 1.3. It's been about 10 years since the last version of TLS came out in 2008 with TLS version 1.2. So in 1.2, a lot of things have changed because it's been 10 years. Lots of significant cryptographic advances have been made, lots of breaks against implementations of TLS, even the protocol itself had a couple problems found in it over the past 10 years. So with TLS 1.3, uh, a lot of people have worked very hard over a really long time to make sure that it's cryptographically as best as it can be. Early last year, Mozilla released some stats talking about the number of HTTPS connections on the internet. And finally, after a long time of having the web up, we finally reached half of the TLS connection, half of the connections over the web were TLS. And it's been increasing ever since. So now I think we're up to probably 65% or more. And that's thanks in part to people like Cloudflare providing free HTTPS on, uh, content, on their content delivery network. Certificate authorities like Let's Encrypt providing free certificates for people to use. And people like Google and Mozilla who have been increasingly making their browser warnings for regular HTTP content progressively scarier. And so websites that maybe had just secured their uh, login page instead of their landing page, now whenever somebody goes there and tries to type in a, a password or search for something on the website, now the browser bar will change to be red instead of just staying a neutral color like it used to. The TLS is a product that's, or a protocol that's created by the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. So the IETF is an international organization. People from all over the world come out and meet about three times a year, and they talk to each other on mailing lists continuously. And they're responsible for things like TCP, email, the things that people use all day long, and that includes TLS. They've been working on TLS 1.3 since probably around 2014 or even 2013, and they got a couple false starts and do-overs, but it's finally almost ready to be released. So the number was just assigned recently, uh, Thursday, a couple days ago, and it's in the final stage right before it becomes a fully fledged web standard. But before we get too much into what's in TLS 1.3, we should talk a little bit about the past so we can understand why it's better. So in all the prior versions of TLS, you notice SSL is a prior version of TLS. They changed the name because Microsoft didn't like calling it SSL because Mozilla came up with that. And there was a big battle, and so they said, fine, fine, we'll just call it something different, and Microsoft was happy with that. And that's, at TLS 1.0, that's when the IETF took over standardization. So SSL 1, 2, and 3, those were all done by Mozilla, or Netscape at the time. And one was so bad, it didn't make it out of the laboratory. Two was a little bit better, but it was still pretty terrible, and they came up with three, and after three, everything seemed to pretty much settle, and they're just little tweaks here and there. The handshake is the most important part of TLS. So the handshake is what sets up all of the security for the whole rest of the connection. So in there, you agree if you're using certs, what certs you're going to use. Is it just the server using a certificate, or is it the client as well? What type of authentication algorithms are they going to use? How is the server going to prove who it is to the client? Well, you have to use some type of cryptographic algorithm. Which one is it? What cipher are you going to use to do the encryption? There's a whole plethora of those. And then finally, how do you get the key that you're going to use in the encryption? With TLS, all the actual data that gets sent over, it's encrypted with symmetric cryptography. So that means both sides have to have the exact same key. Otherwise, one person's going to send data, and the other side's not going to have any idea what to do with it. So the key transport 
or a key agreement between those two sides, that's really important because you don't want to just yell out your key in front of the whole world and then what are you encrypting it for? Everybody's going to be able to see all of the data. So this right now is a poster that I made showing the current best practices in TLS. So that means it's using uh, elliptic curve key exchange. So there's different ways to get that key cut across. And so you can see on the bottom of the client side, the key exchange piece is coming across. So both clients and servers can use certificates. So the first thing you need to agree on is the certificate and the authentication algorithm that you're going to use with that certificate to prove your identity. Certificates are just a key that's tied to an identity. So they're, they're sent across in structures called certificates, but all of that is just a binary blob tying a domain name or a person's email address or some other type of identity to a cryptographic key. And so there's lots of different types of cryptographic keys that you can use with TLS. You can use an RSA key. That seems to be the most common, although the ECDSA is slowly sneaking up as part of things that, as part of the, the ones that people are using more and more. There's also a different way to do the server authentication and client authentication both. So at the same time, if both sides have the same key already, they can just use a pre-shared key, and it's PSK there. So if that's used most of the time, like if you're setting up a VPN between two switches on the internet, and you're an administrator, and you can go log on to one, type in a long password there. You can go log on to the other one, type in the password there. Both sides have this key that's been pre-shared, and they can talk securely. And using the algorithm of the PSK, they can know that nobody else has intercepted the communication. And then there's this other one, none. Yeah, you can use TLS without using certificates. But that means that anybody can step in there in the connection and pretend that they're the other side. So this was an option that somebody wanted to have in TLS in some of the earlier versions. They wanted to be able to encrypt the data, but didn't really care if somebody else was going to step in and try to do an active attack. So if you don't have a cert, that's cool. You don't need to bother with getting all those certificates provisioned out and making sure that they rotate every two years, three years, three months. But you also don't have any protection against an active attacker. But you do have protection against a passive attacker. So people that just needed protection against those passive attacks, the none was good enough for them. The problem is a lot of the times with none, people that were providing server software or some clients were just configuring, give me all of the ciphers and all of the protocols and all of the types of keys and just let my, let my server do everything it possibly can. And when that happens, none's included in there. And if there's an active attacker, he can cause the connection to fall back all the way to not using certs at all. which we would consider bad if you're trying to protect all that data, right? The next thing you have to agree on is the cipher. So there's plenty of ciphers here, even none. The majority of connections right now are using some type of AES. So I have two types there. Some of the newer ones are using this algorithm called ChaCha20, which is super fun to say. And then there's the old standby government algorithm 3DES that IBM came up with back in the 80s that had a, a significant protocol break against it back in 2013 or so. But it's still used out there because some of the clients and some of the servers can't go better. It's like Windows XP is still stuck in 3DES. Luckily, everybody's already off of Windows XP, like the government computers and the HEB returns desk. <laughs> I'm sure. So AES is a block cipher. So there's two major types of symmetric key ciphers. So block ciphers are ones that take big chunks of data and encrypt it, throw it into the encryption algorithm. ChaCha20 is a stream cipher. And with a stream cipher, you have a, a cipher that generates a whole bunch of random numbers. 
and then you take those numbers, just as many as you need, no more than you need to, and you just XOR it with the plain text. And as long as that stream generation is secure, then you can have a secure connection. RC4 is another one I didn't include on this slide. It was also broken around the same time as Triple Des. It's another stream cipher, but it had some problems getting enough randomness in the beginning, and so an attacker could cause it to start over and start over and start over. And whenever you did that, you could guess the ciphertext and be able to decrypt it that way, but just towards the beginning of the connection, which is why you had to keep starting over and over. So you can see there's the two modes of AES up there. The CBC stands for cipher block chaining, and that's a particular mode that has been shown to have some issues recently. So in that intervening 10 years, that's when some people came up with about three different attacks on the chaining block cipher mode, where if you could control some of the data that was sent from the client to the server, like through JavaScript or a Flash program that you're running in the browser, or a Java, program you're running in the browser, turn off Java. You could control the data that was being sent, and then that could let the attacker guess plain text pieces of what you were sending over the connection. So you could decrypt things like cookies or authentication tokens, or if it was email, everybody in their email, whenever it's sending to the server, your username and password is encoded right there in the front part of that message. So if you wanted to attack an email server that was using that mode, you could just get it to keep sending that email, because email servers like to retry sending emails if there's a problem. And whenever that happens, then you could get the user's name and password off of that. The best one to use, of course, is GCM or the ChaCha20. There's two different uh, places that you'd want to use each of those. The AES GCM is really great on desktop computers. So Intel has a cryptographic coprocessor that they include in their chips, and it knows how to do AES really, really quickly. So whenever you do that, it's really fast to do AES on a desktop. But for ARM, press, ARM processors, like in your phone, they don't have that cryptographic coprocessor that knows how to do AES really well. So for mobile devices, you might want to consider using ChaCha20. Both of these ciphers are what's called uh, AEAD, that's Authenticated Encryption with Associated Data. It just means that the ciphertext that gets sent also has a little tag on it that authenticates that it's the actual ciphertext sent. The chaining block cipher mode doesn't, so if an attacker wanted to, they could mess with some of the ciphertext, change it as it's going to its destination. And then the destination server, while it tries to decrypt it, if it's decrypting it, then it will choke on bad encryption and say, whoa, this, this doesn't look right, and send back an error. When that happens, it gives off a timing attack. So that's why the chaining block ciphers aren't really good to use anymore, because of that, protect, that added protection that you get from the AEAD type ciphers. Unfortunately, both of those are only in TLS 1.2, so if you're stuck on an old server or system, you can't use these better ciphers. So this is a guy from Google that runs part of their TLS stack, Adam Langley. So what he's saying is that everything below TLS 1.2 is cryptographically broken. It might not be broken easily by an attacker that's got the latest tools, but cryptographically, from a theoretical standpoint, it's already broken. So you don't want to use it because, as Bruce Schneier says, attacks don't get worse, they only get better. So you want to get off of the older stuff as fast as you can. Now for the key exchange, there's two types. A static, where you use the same key every time, and an ephemeral, where the key keeps changing every connection. So with a static key exchange, you're always using the server's certificate key to do the key exchange. With an ephemeral key exchange, you're changing that key exchange key every time. So if you're doing ephemeral, the keys that you're encrypting with have absolutely no relation to the key that's in the certificate. But with the other one, the static key exchange, the certificate's key is used for doing the key exchange. And what that means is the client is going to take 
a secret seed and encrypt it with the server's public key. So now only the people that have the server's private key, which should just be the server, can decrypt that connection. And that's another way to authenticate who you're talking to because if the server can decrypt your message with that secret seed for the key, then it must be the right one. So whenever you're using ephemeral key exchange, that's using something called forward secrecy and sometimes called perfect forward secrecy. But most people don't call it that because nothing's perfect anymore. And so what that does is use things like elliptic curves or another key exchange mode called Diffie-Hellman. And what that does is it lets both sides come up with a brand new key for every connection swap public keys, and then use their own private key and the other person's public key to agree on a secret. Now, through the powers of math and elliptic curves, they come to the same answer. And anybody looking in the middle, they can see public keys flying back and forth, but because of the way the math works out, they can't derive that secret. And Well, they can, but it's going to take till the sun burns out or maybe even longer because they're going to have to do it manually. The reason why you don't want to use a static key exchange anymore is because anybody that can grab your server's private key can now read back the entire session that you had. So back when the Heartbleed vulnerability came out, people that only had static key exchanges on their servers were really worried about that. Because it meant if somebody had a, a big facility in the middle of Utah that had lots of servers with lots of storage and data in it, and they were maybe listening to all the connections going over the public internet, if they ever broke your key or if you ever lost your key or accidentally put it on pastebin, they could go pull all the data that they had stored up and go decrypt it. So if you were maybe somebody that was sending email to an email exchange that only had the static key on it, and the FBI subpoenaed that email exchange for the private key, and had they been keeping all that data going to the email exchange, they would have been able to see all the plain text that you had ever emailed back or forth from that. And so it's definitely not best practice anymore, and people are trying to get away from it as fast as they can. So now we made it to TLS 1.3. So this is what it will look like as soon as it's released. So it's, this is kind of like a sneak preview on it. So <laughs> it's probably gonna be official in the next week or two, but right now it's, it's held up for the final review from the author of it. It's uh, Eric Rascorla. He works for Mozilla now. So he's doing his final Passover of all the changes that were made by the editors. And then once he's done, then it gets released, and it'll be an official standard. And we already know the number. You can see that they plan something in advance, because all those, all those numbers line up. It's pretty cool how they did that. <laughs> so the, the last RFC that got published is something like 84 01. So they, they skipped over a whole bunch of numbers and went up to the next one that matched the pattern <laughs> instead of just going with the next one. All right. So the TLS 1.3 handshake, like I said, for the other ones, 1.2 and below, the handshake pretty much stayed the same for all of those connections. There's not really any difference. 1.3, though, significantly changes the handshake and how it's done. You still have to agree on all the same things. You still need a cert, you still need an authentication algorithm, a cipher, the key, but the way that it happens this time is different. So RSA is still supported for certificates, but not for key exchange. We'll get to that in a minute though. The, uh, there's a new signing algorithm this time with the TLS 1.3 server proof. So the one that's used in all the prior versions of TLS is uh, PKCS number one, version 1 1.5. There's been cryptographic problems found whenever you use that, especially if you use it with certain settings. 
So rather than continuing to use something that's even just theoretically or barely broken, they said, we're just going to move to the more secure one, and everybody's got to redo their code anyway, so we might as well do that. So they're using PSS for the key exchange for the proof. You can do ECDSA certs as well, same, same as with TLS 1.2 and before. The proof message, the thing that gets signed by the certificate to prove that the, cert, that the server is who they are, instead of just signing a, a little piece of the key that's pretty much the same or could be the same for every conversation, instead what they sign in TLS 1.3 is a hash of everything that's been transmitted in the conversation before that. So there's no chance of replaying these server signatures. So theoretically, an attacker could have grabbed a signature from 1.2 that the server had put as its proof and used it again in a TLS 1.2 style handshake. But with TLS 1.3, because it does the whole transcript, it's got everything the client sent up to this point, everything the server sent up to this point, and then it hashes all of that information and signs that hash and sends it along. The ciphers have cut down significantly. So they, they looked at the no cipher, none, null, no encryption here. And they said, we think we should get rid of this. <laughs> and somebody actually stood up and said, no, but, but I use it. Can't, can we keep it, please? And there was some back and forth, back and forth, and they decided, no, just go ahead and encrypt. It's not going to be that much harder for your servers. The only person that I know that's really doing that and, and means to is the Microsoft Windows update. So they have it hard-coded in all of the other libraries that Microsoft has never to use the null cipher for encryption. Encryption. But for a Windows update, they have it in there. Um, I guess if you're trying to serve like billions of computers all over the world, it probably does save a little bit of processor speed if you don't encrypt every single byte, especially when they're freakishly huge updates that are going out over the wire. But they're going to have to change their ways for 1.3. AES is a mandatory cipher, so if you're implementing TLS 1.3 and you're purporting to implement the full standard, the standard says you have to have AES GCM mode. And you should have ChaCha20, but it's not a mandatory cipher yet. Both of those, remember, are the authenticated ciphers. So you'll notice that the AES CBC mode is not here. Because of the problems that they have with CBC mode, they kicked it out. So now there's only only the best. For the key exchange, we only have ephemeral key exchange. So we talked about why RSA was so bad or the static key exchanges that you had. So this is probably the most contentious change that they made to TLS 1.3. And part of the reason is it turns out they found the IETF found out probably about two years after they decided to take out the static key exchange a little bit late to the party. An association of banks across the US came and said, we were using that. Where'd it go? And the IETF explained to them, like, it's not safe. It's not secure. We don't want to have that in our TLS libraries. We don't want people accidentally configuring it and then shooting themselves in the foot and having somebody be able to decrypt all of the communication they've sent. And so they came back again and said, pretty please? And they shot them down again with, with some stronger language. But they kept going back and forth trying to figure out some way. So there's cryptographic ways to make it look like you're doing an ephemeral key exchange, but not actually do it. And they wanted the IETF to standardize a way to do that. And there was very strong pushback and very strong feelings from uh, a lot of people in the IETF that that went against the spirit of what the IETF was trying to do. So recently the IETF came out with uh, an RFC talking about pervasive surveillance and assisting uh, governments 
people like uh, Iran and Turkey that would intercept civilian communication, decrypt it, and take military action or police action against the individuals. And because of things like that, the IETF took a very strong stance saying, we don't want this type of thing to be standardized. We don't want to assist in helping those governments do this. And so that's why they decided on using only ephemeral key exchanges. The problem is a lot of those banks and other large enterprises here in the US are using that to do things like web application firewalls or uh, assist in debugging connections. So it's super useful if you have something going wrong on your web server that's only going over TLS to be able to look at the plain text messages and see what's going wrong. And you used to be able to just go over to the server and grab the private key and put it on your local desktop and look at all the data going over the connection. But you know that also means that you could take that private key and go look at everybody else's connections and everybody else's data. Some IT shops uh, felt that was fine, or they only let certain trusted individuals or certain trusted computers do it. But with TLS 1.3, that option's now off the table. And software vendors have to go in and find different solutions to be able to accommodate things like debugging. And Chrome and Firefox have taken an approach that makes it useful for an individual developer to be able to go in and set a debugging flag where the browser will actually write out all of the session keys. So all the things that you need to know to be able to decrypt the individual sessions without knowing the server's private key. So if you are going to a web server, you can go into Wireshark and configure Wireshark to look at this list of keys and pick out the best ones that it can use to decrypt all the sessions. And so locally, you're able to still do this type of thing and see all the decrypted connections so you can assist in debugging or things like that. One of the other things that you can see here is in the TLS 1.2 handshake, there's more arrows. Over here, there's less arrows. So that generally means it's a lot faster. And we can talk a little bit more about that in a second. The other thing to notice is the red means encrypted. So TLS 1.3 gets to the encrypted pieces a lot faster than TLS 1.2. So the only thing in 1.2 that's encrypted is the very last message. And the finished message, basically all it is, is it's a block of zeros that's encrypted with the key. So that way you know after you're done trying to agree on all the ciphers and protocols and certs, once you get that last message, you go, OK, can I decrypt this? And if the answer is all zeros, then you're good. Otherwise, you probably should start over and try again, or there's somebody messing with the connection. With TLS 1.3, however, you start encrypting as soon as you can. So with the certificate and the certificate verification, the proof uh, that the server is what it is. And then on the client hello, once you get the information that you need to be able to know what key to generate, you can immediately start encrypting. So you encrypt the finished, me finished message, and then you can also tag on some HTTP data or whatever protocol you happen to be doing TLS over. And so you get that first foray into the application layer a lot quicker with TLS 1.3. There's also another mode, a special mode for TLS 1.3 called zero RTT, which stands for zero round trip time. That means that the client, before it goes back and forth even once with the server, can automatically, or can send on that initial handshake message some early application data. So it's, it's good for things like if you're doing a git slash to a server to get the web page downloaded. You throw that out very first, and then the server, whenever it gets your message, it automatically knows to send you back the web page. So on that very next message, it has the response, and it can send you back the, the first bits of the web page in there. So the way it gets to that encryption key, remember you still have to have the same key on both sides. The encryption key that it gets is based off of a pre-shared key that's negotiated in a previous handshake. 
So if you go to Google and you establish the TLS 1.3 handshake the first time, the server will send back a message that says, hey, if you ever want to talk to me again, use this pre-shared key. And then on the Google side, they'll take that pre-shared key and distribute it across their servers. So next time, if you happen to go to a different server, they won't know about you yet. But Google has secret back channeled this pre-shared key to all of their servers, so they'll have that. So whenever you encrypt that initial message in the zero RTT mode, the server will be able to look at its share of the pre-shared keys and be able to resume and respond to your request. The problem is this early HTTP data that's not protected with forward secrecy. So because it's using a pre-shared key, that pre-shared key is distributed among a bunch of servers, what happens if an attacker copies that message? And instead of just letting it go to the one server that you were trying to go to, what if it takes it and sends it to every Google server on the planet, all at the same time? That might not be a big deal if you're doing something like, give me the homepage for your website. But what if it was a message more like, buy me 10,000 bitcoins? That's a lot of money, and the servers are all going to process that request, and then your bank account's going to be really, really, really negative. So in order to protect against that, there's some very, very stark warnings in the TLS 1.3 RFC that say, this is up to the application level. The app has to know about zero RTT and has to be able to make a good decision on whether or not a request or data that gets sent over that channel is something that is safe to be repeated a billion times across every server. And if it's not, then you need to not send it that way. If it's just, give me the home page, then yeah, that's fine. And you're going to get your answer a lot quicker that way. So let's race the different protocols. So here in the bottom, we have the, the legend. You have the cert and authentication algorithm, the cipher, the encryption key. And then I tossed in the HTTP request and an HTTP response. So first up, we got TLS 1.2. The client sends over its first message. It's got what ciphers, a, a list of ciphers the client supports, a list of the types of certificates the client supports. There's no keys or anything that it can decide on because it doesn't know what the server has. So the server sees the client's list and says, oh, yeah, yeah, that cipher looks good. We'll use that. That cert algorithm looks good. We'll use that one. And here's my certificate. Once the client gets that, it can either, use, either using the ephemeral key exchange or the static key exchange, it can send the server the encryption key or the message to allow the server to generate the encryption key. So after that, we've got everything down. We know what to do. But the server still has to send back a message that says, OK, we're good now. Let's start talking. Then finally, you can do your HTTP request and response. So that takes a pretty good long while. Because it took so long, they decided, after looking at a lot of internet traffic, that some of the messages could be cheated, or they called it false start. So there's, there's a way to send some extra messages. So let's look at how that looks. So the first two back and forth, the first round trip is the same. Then whenever the server, or when the client has the encryption key that it knows about, it can also tack onto that an HTTP request before it's heard back from the server, OK, yeah, let's start talking encryptedly. So they looked at the data and recognized that most of the time, the server all would respond with, OK, yeah, we're good. Let's start talking. So there wasn't really a need to wait for the server to tell you you're good. You could just assume that the server's good, because that's the way it worked most of the time. And so that ended up shaving a whole round trip off the connection. So they started implementing this back in, I think, around 2012 or so. And a lot of the clients, uh, Chrome and Firefox, things like that, they started using it. So now with TLS 1.3, it starts off looking a whole lot like TLS 
The client sends its information. The server says, okay, yeah, here's a cert. Here's a cipher we're going to use. But in the very first message the client sends, because all of the connections are now ephemeral key exchanges, the client can send its ephemeral key without having to wait for the server to say, hey, let's use the ephemeral key exchange, because it already knows it's going to say that, because it's TLS 1.3. So it'll also send the encryption key along with that. And then the following looks just like TLS 1.2. So you improved a little bit. You got the encryption key faster. But it's still the same number of round trips. But with the, full, with the zero RTT mode, you can get it a whole lot faster. Because this is doing a resumption, the client already knows everything that it needs to to start the conversation. And it can send that initial HTTP request in the very first message that it sends, which means the server can respond with the HTTPS response on that very first thing that it sends back to the client. And as part of the zero RTT mode, what it does is it renegotiates a new encryption key to use for the rest of the connection. So the server, as part of that response, will say, hey, here's my, my new ephemeral key. Go ahead and recalculate a new encryption cipher, a new key to use for the rest of the encryption of this, com of this conversation. So measuring this in going across the Pacific, because it's a round number, the Atlantic, I know it's more popular, but the numbers don't add up as well. So 200 milliseconds to go across 400 for the TLS 1.3 normal mode and the false start mode to get that connection, to get that response back, or 600 milliseconds for the old way of doing TLS with, without the false start in there. So you can see from this that a lot of those seconds add up quite significantly whenever you start throwing a whole bunch of different connections across the, especially if you're going across the ocean, but even if you're going to a server closer to you, you still save a whole lot of time and multiply it off across a whole bunch of clients that saves everybody a lot of time all over. So with the, uh, with the TLS 1.3, what they started doing as they got closer to finishing the RFC two years ago, where they were almost done, they started rolling out drafts on test platforms, like Google and Cloudflare properties would roll out an initial version of TLS 1.3. And they would turn it on for either if you ask them too nicely or for a small section of their users. And whenever they did that, they started finding little problems with things like firewalls. So a lot of times firewalls are hard code things like a TLS connection always starts with these hex digits. And if it doesn't, then it'll block the connection. And that's not good if you want somebody to adopt your protocol. That happened with TLS 1.2. And this, it was standardized in 2008. Microsoft didn't turn it on by default until around 2014 because it took that long for people to upgrade all their old firewalls and application-knowledgeable middle boxes. So in order to prevent that type of problem with TLS 1.3, they started trying out drafts to see, hey, we think this will work. Let's try it out in the real world and see what breaks. And lots of stuff broke. Google ended up kicking a university off the internet because they all use Chromebooks. And they were going through a certain vendor's middle box that didn't know anything about TLS 1.3 and couldn't handle it. And so whenever it saw it, it said, I don't know what this is, kill it. And somebody at Google made the worst mistake of having the server that sends out the updates to say, oops, that was a mistake, roll back. They upgraded that to TLS 1.3 as well. <laughs> And so they couldn't roll it back. And so the university was pretty mad at a couple people at Google for sending that out without an option for them to turn it back off, except for one at a time going into the, the deep internal settings of Chrome. So they learned from that mistake, fixed a couple things, 
tried it again. They still had problems. Not with that vendor, not with a couple of the other ones, but they still found a couple edge cases where things were expecting something that looks like TLS 1.2. Whenever it didn't see that, it barfed all over the connection and no traffic flowed. So they ended up saying, okay, fine. We're gonna completely change the way we negotiate the protocol. So now instead of saying in the first little section of bits in TLS 1.2, Three and 1.2 where it says, I do TLS 1. whatever. Instead of doing it there, we're going to put in an extension where none of these middle boxes are looking, so it shouldn't break anything, right? We're going to put it down there, and we're just going to hard code TLS 1.2 up in the initial thing. So now all the TLS 1.3 connections, whenever they come across the wire, they say, I'm TLS 1.2, let me through. And all the middle boxes say, okay, cool, come on in, it's a party. So negotiation is also different in TLS 1.3, but it's only so that it can get rolled out faster. And so what they were able to do is roll it out in last month, at the beginning of the month, it was already at 5% adoption over the Cloudflare servers. And right now they finalized all the, the binary bits of TLS 1.3. Like I showed you, they've got the draft ready to go. As soon as that rolls out, OpenSSL is going to release their next version. It's going to have TLS 1.3 in it. Microsoft is working on their version of it. Apple's already got their version ready to go. Firefox has had theirs in beta testing for a long time. So the internet's already ready and even chomping at the bit ready to go. So TLS 1.3, built for security, built for speed, now available mostly. These are some of the things that I'm getting ready to work on, so I'll, I'll put these out on my website pretty soon. This is a kind of a deep dive in the weeds, if you will, for TLS 1.2. I've already got them done and mostly written up. I just haven't released them yet. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing with 1.3, so you can look at the actual bytes going over the wire and see what they're used for and how they're used. So you can look on my website, cem.me, and that should be coming up pretty soon. So thank you for coming out. Appreciate it.